and I and I read about Les Schwab and started hearing some stories about them and and the stories were like well I don't know if it can be because their profitability that was being talked about was double of what the average in the industry is making or at, those of us in the middle of the pack were making five to seven points and here's someone that's possibly making 15 points now I hadn't been there yet I hadn't seen any actual numbers but so that motivated me to try to get in there and initially I was not met by the <laughs> telephone people about or encouraged to come out. So I, I met the upper management in a buying group that I happened to be a part of and uh, and kind of a deal I learned a long time ago is how do I get close to somebody and I thought well we had our meetings but then we had our social time together too. At social time whether they knew it or not I was very close to them and I was trying to figure out who I could get to know in that company. Well, it turned out one of the guys in, in there was a former Marine, as I am, and so uh, Phil Powell is his name, and uh, so I worked at getting to know them better at social times. You know, I was invited out to uh, the Les Schwab organization after getting to know the guys, and I flew to Portland, Oregon, and I think they had about 15 stores there, and I was you know, trying to figure out where to start, and uh, we started with a store, it was Lake Oswego. But anyhow, as I drove up there that morning, and I saw the hustle bustle at early in the morning, everyone's kind of running and moving, doing things, and then what was kind of interesting, a car drove up, and someone greeted that car uh, before the person got out, they were there. I thought, well, that's, you know, it's the morning, you know, they got a little extra time, they're not real busy yet. Well, to kind of finish that story, every place I visited after that, they met the customer at the parking spot. And uh, I thought, I don't know how they could do that, how it disrupted, but anyhow, that being said. So anyhow, as I visited, there was so many unique things going on. First of all, their speed of how they moved around and everyone seemed, no one was yelling orders, everyone seemed to know what they were doing uh, without supervision and so as I watched this you know and, and I started seeing and one time I remember I, I had a little time and this guy was moving his big tr truck tire back and forth or truck tires to the, to the truck back to the changer back finally he stopped and he said uh, I'd gotten to know him a little bit and he said Mr. Erickson when I slow down or when it slows down, I'll answer any questions you might have. And I said, you keep up because I didn't want to ruin anything here. You know, keep, let them keep working and when he gets some time, we'll talk. He stopped when he had time and he said, any questions? And I, could, I said, one of my guys that was with me said, why do you run like this? And he thought about it and he said, I think the customer wants me to. I'm going, you got to be kidding me. He could have said the boss makes me or I just am that type of guy that I like to run or something. No, it was the customer. And to me, if we think about it, that's, that's who makes us successful, happy customers. So uh, it was things like that that, that I noticed, uh, you know, the customer in many things. I remember one time they were moving the tickets of customers who were there, and I looked and they were moving a customer. A ticket up beyond the ones that were there earlier. This moved past, and I so I had to ask, why is that ticket being moved in front of the others? They said it's a flat repair, and customers a flat to a customer is an emergency. So we try to make them happy, and well, that was something I never heard of before, but it was absolutely true. If you have a flat rep and you're running around without a spare, do. Uh, you're uncomfortable. You're th what if I have a flat tire? What's going to? What am I going to do? They would try to take care of that right there as fast as possible. And then the curb appeal. Everything was clean. Um, the the waiting room, ample room. They had tires in the in the waiting room. They 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 call it the supermarket. So you'd walk in and you'd see literally hundreds of tires stacked in tire racks, very neatly. So you knew you were in a tire store, and uh, it was just unbelievable. They had popcorn in every store, and I found out later the popcorn was to get rid of the smell of the tires a little bit. But 
everyone was eating popcorn. Yeah, it was free popcorn, and uh, so it was just the environment that made you feel uh, good. And I noticed as many ladies there as men, and a lot of times ladies don't like the maintenance with the car, but they were comfortable coming there. I could see hmm, they feel comfortable. I thought, boy, what a what a nice issue when you get there that the, that the wives or the ladies will bring the car in, you know, for whatever reason. I, then I realized I got to figure out what really, how this happens. And, and the thing that I found with Schwab was they had regular meetings. They would have a monthly meeting when, when the month, when they got the financial statement of how the previous month went. They had a morning meeting. And it was always the 15th of the month, 10th to the 15th. They got a quick statement back to the employees. And all the employees had a copy to look at that at the meeting. And so everyone knew how they had done. So they personally had a, a stake in the game and they let them see all the numbers. So I, I started realizing, you know, I can't believe. And they, as some business says, well, those numbers aren't important, so we won't put them in there. I looked at their, found out their statement. They had all the numbers in there, whether it was whether it was taxes or whatever expenses were, it was a regular statement. So uh, they, be, they were stakeholders. I, and I started seeing that, so I said, okay, how do you hire for that? They would not let uh, people work there that weren't carrying their load. Well, yeah, what, what happened, again, I was talking to Phil, uh, Powell, who was the Marine, at, at a tire meeting, and uh, I looked over and I said, isn't that less? And I got that from, he wrote a book and he had his picture in the front of the book. He said, that is less. I said, would you introduce me? I got to meet the guy. I mean, by that point, I'd probably been out there, I don't know, 10 years or, you know, 10 times. And there were three, four-day meetings. They weren't, and they weren't me meetings, really. They were me observing. And... Uh, so he took me over there, and uh, and uh, Les stood up, and uh, here's a guy, well, probably in his 70s by that point, or in his 60s anyhow, and uh, and uh, I introduced myself, and um, he said uh, his first question out of his mouth, "Tell me what you're doing for your employees." I thought, oh my goodness. So I went through. By that point, I had adapted. Uh, from learning from them, started getting into the profit sharing program and how we did things where we had a retirement plan set up for the employees and things that they had done. And uh, so when I, it was a kind of a short meeting because with the, the business meeting was getting started so we had to get back inside. And um, uh, Les wanted to know how many times I'd been out there because he could sense that I think that I had copied a lot of things that I had witnessed out there. And I knew it was a winning combination. There was no way around it. And so I started realizing that uh, he had figured a lot of things out. And I'm a believer. And if you don't have your own plan, copy a good one. And that's, that's what we did. And so he made comments like, you know, he said, ask me if I was for sale, if I'd sell to them. <laughs> and... I, I don't know where that remark came from, but it actually came, and then I thought, oh my goodness, I didn't know if he thought I'd figured it out enough that I was going to be a competitive issue, but I, here I am on the west, East Coast, he's on a completely on the West Coast, and we never, that subject never came up again, so uh, it was just a comment he had made to me. And, and what I found, too, when you do this, one thing I didn't mention it, that I didn't notice right away, but as I got studying it more, I realized they, had, they didn't have any middle management. And what's middle management? It's someone who's kind of working with the stores, moving around, kind of keeping an eye on things. But they made sure that their teammates were all aboard and working hard and at the, for the objective. Take care of the customer. Let's do it right the first time. Let's get it done as quick as possible get them in, get them out. And so they thought this way, they thought this way. So they were in charge of that. So they would take it, they would speak up at meetings. If they had someone that wasn't carrying his weight, the manager didn't have to come down on him. His teammates would be on him 
because they had a, a piece of the action here. They didn't need money being spent for someone not carrying his weight and doing his job. So they did, and then of course how they looked after equipment and uh, very sensitive that, you know, how we talked to the customer. I, I never saw any abuse of that, but I, I, I sensed that, you know, someone didn't, was a little quick with the customer, he'd get talked to by his fellow teammate. Hey, listen, that's the person who pays our, our wages. You need to, if you've got a problem today, you need to get back over on the machine and we'll talk to the customer. You know, because people, human beings can have a bad day, but not in front of the customer. Well, he was a fairly new employee in that store. He was in one of our other stores. He was the mechanic, a very good mechanic. I remember he was a motorcycle driver and later got hurt on it. But he uh, called me one day and he was comfortable enough with me, I was the owner, that uh, he said, Mr. Erickson, is it true I get a piece of the profits over here? And he was kind of new at that store. And it was a well-run, it was a profitable store. It was one of our better stores. And, um, and I said, yes. He said, well, I'm, I'm here to tell you the manager is stealing from us. I said, hmm, can you be a little more? And the guy had, it was into drugs or something and giving deals to, get to people that he owed money to or something like that. And I won't get into all the details. We didn't. So what we did is we ran a drug test on all the guys and found out the manager, yes. But he got reported because the guy started off the whole thing as, am I sharing profits here? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, who knows what he might. But now the guy was reaching into his pocket as far as he felt, doing something wrong. Our shrinkage issues went to little or nothing because everyone was watching what was going on. He used the word shrinkage, but as far as stealing or giving deals to the, that weren't supposed to be, those things were few and far between is the way it looked to us. We, we had very few problems with people abusing uh, the program, whether it's pricing or service or whatever. Yeah. And we never had cameras. And, and the reason we talk, that would have been an expense. But if they took the objective to watch everything themselves and make sure everyone was doing it right, we didn't need cameras. Um, uh, and there's another story here. This is within the administration of my company. And uh, uh, our, our uh, administrator, uh, Peggy, was uh, three of them ran the store, uh, ran the administration. And I had friends that I would visit in some of these groups were in with si same size operations. I probably had six people in administration. We had three. And one time, more than once, I would say to Peggy, <clears throat> are you sure you got enough help? And her quick defense was, in, in, she was respectful, was, are we not doing our job? Or the statements are supposed to be out on the 15th, if we ever miss that. Is the computer down? All the things she was in charge of. I'd say, no. She said, Mr. Erickson, we don't need more equipment. We don't need, there's times we did, but she was kind of coming forth herself. It wasn't me asking those times. That, but she kept that and to the point that she knew, and she was on a bonus system too, if she, she improved uh, her expenses, and she got her kept her expenses down to a certain point. We had a certain level that she she was authorized to spend, or you know, any savings below that. She and the two ladies happened to be all three ladies in there got half of it, and that was a Les Schwab sharing program too. So he had that in administration, uh, had that in the warehousing, had it wherever he could to set up objectives. Any savings, you shared in it. Well, I think if the, if, if the, you know, the game plan is thought out and then you got to explain it and they got to see that it's doable. And, and so that was the basic thing is, so, and, and then they're going to share in the, 
as the, as the Romans said, in the booty. They're going to share in the profit of, of, of what they do. And once they come aboard to the point of feeling that they're part of the company, we call it stakeholders, there's other words for that, but they become part. They become part of the whole deal. And so they, what we saw happening there, whether it was how they treated the customer, how they, how they dressed, how, clean, neat, shaven, how they uh, interacted with, with each other, uh, and then as I got further into it, how they looked after the equipment, because if they had to spend money on equipment quicker than by not taking care of something, versus I'll take care of my equipment and get more life out of it, that was profits for them. And it wasn't at the expense of the customer at all. It was just in-house, we're going to do a better job of looking after our, our facilities and our equipment so that we can, hopefully some of that will drop into profits and, and we get a share of that. They want, it's got to be easily understood. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy to get the job done. But the program has to be simple and that they know what, what's in it for them it's not the only reason they're there, but they, they know that if they have certain, if we have success in the store, they know that they're going to get a piece of that, and they pretty well know how much that is. So, yeah, it had to be very explainable. It had to be transparent. They would know uh, how many hours we worked the hourly people that week. We would track that. And so, uh, at the end of the day, the more that we uh, well-run store, they'd come in and say, Let's see the numbers. They wanted to see the numbers before they went home. Well, that's the way owners think. What are the numbers? In our profit sharing, the, the month ending check to the hourly people could be like a fifth payday. It had a, it had a dollar amount that was equal to their weekly pay. So it could, now that was the ones that, and they don't all get there overnight, but we, we would track them and very closely, and they, they'd know what other guys were making, so they said, well, if they make it at that store, that should be in line for us at some point. Well, there's a couple stipulations that we would try to put in there. First of all, if it is a well-run company, it should grow. And the guys knew, uh, all of us knew if a store wasn't growing, there was something wrong. What's wrong with that store? So they all took an interest watching the numbers that, to ensure they grow. And they did, we, we would, in our weekly meetings, constantly talking about the important issues, taking care of the customer, doing it quickly, doing it right the first time, you know, getting, keeping folks in order. Boy, they knew, hey, uh, that car got in front of me. I mean, little things like that. But they, for them to, uh, had to take the interest like the most important person, there is, a lot of times, tire changer absolutely made things run or not run right by just their involvement out on, on a, in the front out there. So, uh, very important uh, that they knew the program, knew what potential roadblocks were. We'd cover that in meetings, uh, they, but they constantly, we try to constantly talk about customer service, customer service. What, what's that take? What's it take to keep the customer happy? My first 10 years I was with a company and I had a minority stake in the stores that I built and I built three and when I left we had 33 stores I think it was. When I started we had 16 so in 10 years we'd kind of doubled the company. So that was, and I was excited to start with to have stock and then, and I could see how my deal was, it was transparent, I was the manager but there was no profit sharing with everyone else. Uh, there was, might be some bonuses, and it wasn't that we were taking advantage of anyone, but they didn't have a Schwab type deal. But staying with, with, with stock, so then as I got further along, I realized I might want to exit. Because uh, minority stock in small companies, it's, if, if you are uh, aggressive and, and wanting to move on or get bigger and better in your mind, you know, if that's part of growing. Uh, sometimes they say, well, what's it take to become a majority stockholder, to get over the 50%? Well, I found out when you're a minority stock, there wasn't, 
there wasn't a big market for, for you to sell your stock to someone else. It was usually to the majority stockholders and their deal was to was initially to make you happy to come aboard and we're going to give you stock, but there was a problem in, in turning that into cash. So I'm much more in favor of something that's cash oriented. You know, as I talk of profit sharing, it's been so heavy on my mind the last couple of years as, as, I, as Danny and I have kind of put this book together and the thing that, that kept coming back in my mind Profit sharing was, was, was kind of the, the real issue you wanted to get to. You wanted to, a company that's not making a profit, first of all, is not, you got to get it profitable. But how do I get it there and grow it from there? And I found from observing Schwab and then putting it in my own company, people realized it was human to want to do better next year than last year. And when you got a share of what you did better next year, uh, it was a motivator. And it is, you know, I, I went through some times thinking, well, is this all about money? No, but it is about getting the fruits of your labor. And so I think uh, without profit sharing, you, you, there's a missing link in a business. And a lot of times they've been there for years and years, and a lot of times they do have them. I've, Got a friend I was talking to recently. He was in Europe, and he was part of a company that had profit sharing, and they were competing with a company that didn't. He said, "We we beat him hands down," and he felt profit sharing could well have been the deal. He wasn't as engrossed in it as I think I have become, especially uh, as I observed those 19 years. And I'm going when someone doubles the industry standards in net profit, and then what as I looked and kind of to give some some proof to the pudding here this company was started in 1952 uh, remained owned by the Schwab family the, the family owned it shared the profits the exact number of stores it seems around the 400 range sold recently I haven't seen the number but the, the it, the, the number in the streets was for three billion dollars. I'm telling you, a, a business, I don't care what kind of vision you're in, that is a multiple that's, that is so strong of what they had, but it was because of its profitability. And what we heard from the investors who bought it, uh, again, I wasn't first hand at this, but they were going to leave it alone. Don't fool with this thing. This thing is, <laughs> is a good one. So I, I think I, the time going to the West Coast, those 19 years, and then bringing it back, and it wasn't without problems, because I had to change a going machine that I had and slowly move that together. A couple times I moved too fast, and I had some repercussions. So I had to rethink that. Okay, how do I get this put in? And it took me, it took me a while to get it put in. And then I did it. I didn't put it in all the stores. You had to meet a certain standards before I would let a manager get into it. And when I did, it was going to it was going to be a bigger percentage of the profits that I, as owner, would give up. But everyone that got on it, it, it turned out to be well worth my investment too.